Aloha and welcome again. From the 21st Annual Native Hawaiian Convention, we bring to all of you some of these panels that our audience here got to witness, but we're bringing right to you, right into your home, your offices, your phones, these really important discussions that happened here and continue to happen across our Paya'aina. Sit back and enjoy. Aloha. Hello, I'm Mike Kaho. Good morning. What an amazing event this is. I really would like to congratulate CNHA for the incredible events they've put on. My name is Pauline Sheldon, and I am deeply honored and touched to have the privilege of moderating this panel today on a topic that is very dear to my heart, and I've been studying teaching for a number of years, but I'm more honored to be here on the platform with our four mayors. We have uh, Mayor Victorini from Maui, we have Mayor Mitch Roth from Big Island, we have Mayor Kawakami from Kauai, and at the other end, Mayor Blangiati from Honolulu. So <clears throat> I'd just like to set the stage for a couple of minutes about sustainable and regenerative tourism, because we're being asked to step up our game. We're being asked to shift from sustainable to regenerative tourism. And the theme, as has been said often of this conference, Hulihia, is about great transformational change. And tourism is an incredible force for transformation. It's a force for transformation of us when we travel. We've all experienced that. And it's a force for change for the destinations to which we travel. But the job of us today for this next hour on this panel is to really talk about how we can ensure that that change is for the overall well-being of the destination, the quality of life of our community. And many of you probably already got your heads around sustainable tourism. There are many initiatives. We have the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We have Hawaii Green Growth and the uh, uh, Aloha Plus Challenge, which I know our four mayors have been working on and have been incredible leaders in that. Thank you for that, mayors. And there are many initiatives that have been worked on and are still being worked on. But now we're being asked to ramp up. We're being asked to go from sustainable to regenerative tourism. So I have a question for every one of you in this room. Is anybody a bit confused about what regenerative tourism is? Would you raise your hand? <laughs> I, my hand is raised because, you know what? It's a very complex topic when you really get down to it. It's something we have to chew on for a while before we can digest it. Sometimes I think it's a bit like a diamond with many, many, many facets. And depending on which angle you're looking at and how the light is shining determines what you see. So before I hand over to our esteemed mayors, I'd just like to pinpoint what I see as five facets on this diamond. There are many, many more. But I thought it might give us a platform to move forward. So the first thing, of course, is when we move from sustainable to regenerative, we're no longer preserving our assets and protecting our culture and our environment. We are revitalizing it. We're contributing to its growth. So it's, it's more than sustaining. The second thing is, and that's perhaps the most important, is it requires a value shift. We have to start valuing different things when we do regenerative tourism. And this is why HTA's Malama mandate is so important. It allows us to align behind values. And many destinations around the world that I've worked in are looking at value shifts, going away from self-interest towards community interest, away from greed to generosity, away from profit to well-being, and many, many of these. But our indigenous community here has an incredible wealth that can be a platform for regenerative tourism here. The third thing I think is an important component of regenerative tourism, and that has to do with how we talk about tourism. You know, we so often talk about the tourism industry, and we put it off in a silo. And when we use the term industry, it implies production and cost and efficiency. Tourism is way more than that. Tourism is about people. It's about a system 
and it's about a system that's embedded in other living systems, our food systems, our health systems, our technological systems. So regenerative tourism requires that we look at system-wide. The next one, which is so important and why I'm so delighted that tourism is on this agenda at the CNHHA conference is because we have to empower the community to be engaged in tourism decision-making going forward. And then the last one, before I hand over to our mayors, is that regenerative tourism is a journey. It's not a destination. It requires us to put our heads and our hearts together and to ask the deep questions and continue the process moving forward. Will we ever get to being regenerative? I don't think so, but we'll engage processes and we'll ask questions and we'll honor each other with our values and we'll move forward. So those are just a few of my ideas to start us off. Okay, so let's hear from our mayors um, in terms of what they're up to and how they understand the shift from sustainable to regenerative tourism and what they're doing on their islands. And I'd like to begin with Mayor Roth, if I could. All right, aloha. aloha. You know, as I think about this whole thing about regenerative tourism, I, I think about what our focus through our administration has been, and that's sustainability. And that's another word that if you put out the word sustainability, everybody would have a different definition. And so let me share with you what my definition is for Hawaii Island, and we'll bring it into regenerative tourism. So my definition of sustainability for Hawaii Island is making sure that our keiki can raise their keiki here, and their keiki in turn can raise their keiki here in Hawaii. <laughs> and you need to be intentional about that, and you, you need to understand what would that take? Well, one, it's gonna take uh, quality jobs and affordable housing, and a heavy emphasis on affordable housing, because I think we're all looking at that from all of our all of our islands, and that comes into this whole talk about regenerative tourism as well. And you're right; it's a system. We have to be looking at not just one thing; it's about everything. So, as I think about regenerative tourism, I think it's it's a shift in thinking. And our team that has been working on the DMAP together with HTA, our R&D department, our community, and all of our partners, I think one of the things they looked at is making sure that as we rebuild tourism, we're rebuilding tourism around our communities versus the way that was done before, which was we built our communities around tourism. So if you're thinking you know, how you move forward, um, we need to put our communities up in the very front of that. And we have to think about what it is that we want. You know, what is it that's gonna keep our keiki here? I have three kids, they're all living on the mainland. We talked about jobs, we talked about um, housing, but you have to think about things that are anchors to them. The environment, um, the culture. You know, having that, that appreciation for where you come from. And so as we think about regenerative tourism, I, I think that we have to take into account, especially as we go through the second renaissance of Hawaiian culture, language, um, and history, that, that renaissance and what we would like to see and move forward into the future. So that's kind of my definition, if there is a definition in there of regenerative tourism. Thank you very much, Mayor Roth. Mayor Blanchardi, would you like to pick up? Yes, thank you, Pauline. First of all, before I say anything, uh, I want to congratulate Kuiya Lewis and the Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement for this incredible conference. And Kuiya and, and that team there have been great partners for us through COVID in our rent and utility relief distribution of monies. We're really proud. Honolulu is ranked the number one city in the country in getting that done. And the Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement were incredible partners in making that happen. It really helped a lot of lives. You know, Pauline, I read your white paper on regenerative tourism. And I, if you're confused, I might be even more confused after reading it because I thought, I thought you really nailed it. And, um, you know, I, I would tell you that I was thinking in preparation for today, when was the first time I heard that term? And I'm really not so sure when I first heard it. And then when I did hear it and began to think about it, I thought it was maybe just a buzzword 
But I've come to learn very quickly it's much more than that. So in that regard, rather than offer a verbal definition, let me just say, and I say this on behalf of my team, because it is such a privilege to be the mayor of the city and county of Honolulu at this point in time. At this moment in time, just as Scott said a few moments ago, we are at a very special place. It is a time of transformation. It is a time of decision making. So let me just offer a couple of things that we were able to get done in our first 18 months. First and foremost, Bill 41. You know, we know in 2019 we had over 3 million people staying in illegal short-term vacation rentals that robbed our neighborhoods, drove up prices, took housing off the market. Everybody said we couldn't get that legislation passed. We did. That begins in effect in October. We think it's going to go a long way to helping manage tourism. I'm also very, very proud of what we were able to get done uh, with respect to Bill 38. When we talk about regenerative tourism, thank you. Regenerative tourism has a lot to do with people leaving the place better than when they found it. And we found it on Waimanalo, our beaches were being overrun by a lot of commercialism and really not caring for the place at all. Not only that, really being very rude and disrupting to our local population there. And so while I'm not a big fan of bans, we signed that bill. We signed that bill with the intention of telling people, no, you cannot come here and do that. And so hopefully, on a going forward basis, thank you. And so hopefully on a going forward basis, we maybe can lift the ban and have a good statewide or island-wide policy where we can share our beautiful lands, but in a way that people come to respect it and leave it better. The third thing is Hanama Bay. One of the first things we did is we took control of Hanama Bay using technology and everything afforded to us because we saw during COVID how the bay responded. You know, and marine life came back, the water got clearer, the coral became healthier in just that short period of time. And so now we monitor that and we charge people, we keep it free for locals, but the control of that precious resource is something we're very proud of. And it's a contribution, I believe, to the island of Oahu and really for the world because it's such an incredible place. The fourth thing is Haiku Stairs, big decision. We're taking down Haiku Stairs beginning this fall. Um, we looked at that every which way. Every which way. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get something constructed on the other side of the island that gives people that unique hiking experience. We're not going to give up on that effort, but we're going to begin to take down the stairs. And the last thing I'll say is that our efforts locally, especially in our resort destinations on crime and homelessness, are unprecedented right now. And we have an unprecedented cooperation, level of cooperation with the judiciary for the first time our prosecutor's office and HPD, and maybe some of you saw last week, it was announced that the judiciary decided to drop off the ROIs, release on recognizance. And so now anybody that's arrested down here has got to spend the night in jail and face the prosecutor the next morning in front of a judge to determine what the course of action should be as opposed to just getting arrested and then released. We think that's going to go a long way, along with geographic exemptions, which means if you get caught and you're arrested, and you, you're convicted, you can't go back into that area. So we need to clean that up, the humanity of that, to really make it an enhanced visitor experience, but also something we can all feel proud of, because we want people, first and foremost, starting with our local residents, to feel safe, but certainly our visitors. So that would be my, offer, my definition, if you will, of regenerative tourism, and we just only have just begun. Thank you very much, my Blanjadi. And thank you for all your initiatives to bring it about. Can I go to Mayor Kawakami now in Kauai? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Derek. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, Scott got up on stage, and I think the first thing that he alluded to was how nervous he felt being up here, and I have this beautiful Miley Lay and my mom's knee how shell lay and I ran into a few Kauai people and so I very much feel at home so thank you very much for being welcoming it's a, it's a tough question because tourism in and of itself is something that takes so much from everyone, from our home, from our people. But it's also an industry that gives back. 
And when I think about the term regenerative, which is a hard word for me to pronounce, I'm glad I pulled that one off. <laughs> I think about simple things my mom would tell me, like, son, you represent our family and our island. Make sure you leave people and places better than what you found it in. And I really think um, that's what that word means, is if there's a way that we can get people who have fallen in love with our home to not just come here and be visitors, because we're all visitors, but to really help to get in there and give back and to tread lightly and go beyond that, but help us to restore our Vahipan and our very special places. I think that's what that word means to me. Thank you. Thank you for those beautiful thoughts, Derek. <laughs> and we'll be coming back to some of your ideas there to flush them out a little more. Over to Mayor Vittorini. Aloha, everyone. And I'm not sure if you saved the, last, the best for last or the worst for last. I'm not sure on this thing. And I am, and, and I gotta be honest, I'm not as articulate as my colleagues here. I speak from the heart. And I don't use the word tourism in my vocabulary. I use the word hospitality. To me, Hawaii has always been the most hospitable world, place in the world. We welcomed all who came. My great grandparents were welcomed here. And they learned to understand and work within the culture. Let me give you some example of what regenerative tourism and with sustainable tourism both meet at a, in, at a crucial junction. As you well know, when you go to anybody's home, before you walk in, what do you do? What do you do? Come on. You take your slippers or your shoes off, right? That's not Hawaiian. That came from the Japanese. The ukulele, where did that come from? All right, now we got some conversation. You know, but our culture, our host culture, is made up of many other parts of cultures that came in and enhanced what you had. But we honor you. In Maui, we honor you in many ways. I've purchased 500 acres in Waiale, a sacred battlefield which was set for development. We turned it around, and now it's in preservation forever for you, the Kanaka Maoli. We have our halau of Oivi to give our kumu and our hula halaus a sense of place, not nomads going from place to place, practicing on fields, in schools, you will have in Maui a place to put your equipment and store it, to meet, to enjoy, to practice, and be what I call the uh, ambassador of aloha that hula is for Hawaii. Also, all of my mayors have said all the things I would say, so that's why I ditto, I can go right there, ditto. Real easy, you know, when you're the last, you either ditto or you're going to be quiet and just walk off the stage. <laughs> so I'm leaving right now. Oh, no, no, no. But let me say a couple quick things and then we'll get started with the questions. Also, Maui, before the pandemic, I changed the policy of no commercial ventures on our beach parks on fr Sundays and holidays. So our residents had a sense of place. No walking over surfboards or kiteboards, right? but Maui did that even before the pandemic. And now we're going to add Saturday. So our residents will have long weekends to enjoy their family without traversing commercial activities. That's part of what Hawaii needs. And finally, aloha. I don't know any other way to live but aloha. Not that I get along with all of you. And some of you, you don't like me. I live with that. And some days, even my lovely wife of 46 years doesn't like me. 
So now that's a, that's a revelation. So please, I know that's going to be on KGME tonight. I just know that. <laughs> but really, aloha is the, is the essence of Hawaii. And regenerative tourism really means being aloha. We need to give back more than we take in the hospitality industry. We need to make sure that the hospitality industry is you, the community. And every community is different. What's good in South Maui will not be good in Molokai or Hana. And what's good in West Maui may not be good in Wailuku. We got to know our communities. And the, you, the community, have to come out and help us. Because so many times, and I'm going to be honest with you locals, because I am, we sit back and we were told as kids, do what is right and you don't have to tell anybody else what you did. Be humble. Well, I'm finding out being humble sometimes gets you kicked in the head. But realistically, that's Hawaii. And I will not change our values for anything. We live in the best place. We are blessed to be in a beautiful world. And now we have a chance to change that world and make, not change it, we will enhance it. We will move it forward. And together, regenerative tourism will be what we call the journey that makes Hawaii ne no kaoi. Mahalo. Thank you, all four of you. Very inspiring. Okay, my next question digs a bit deeper. John DeFries at HTA has often said that in the Native Hawaiian culture, the DNA of the Native Hawaiian culture has all of the regenerative principles in it. And I really believe that. And we're starting to work those. Mez, what do you think about that? Do you think that there's some specialness here that we can really become a leader for the rest of the world based on the wisdom that our indigenous culture has? Can I be first this time? Yes. I have to ask permission. I love this lady, you know, but I ask permission. No offense to you guys, okay? I love my marriage too. By the way, you know, let me say mahalo to Kuhio and his group. Let's give Kuhio a big hand, please. Come on. And let me say this. In the three and a half years that I have been mayor of Maui County, which I've been honored to be, I've been working with these three other gentlemen and two others that came before them, and I can say my, from my deepest part of my heart, the aloha, the affection, but more important, the collaboration and the wisdom I was able to pick up, even from my son, Derek. <laughs> so let's give them a big hand, please, for what they've done. <laughs> Let me say and answer the question now. I, you know, I, like, I like Scott, I get off script now. Get back to script. Um, I agree with John. The DNA of Hawaii is something that no other place in the world has. As I mentioned about hospitality, we welcome people here. I worked in the industry for 27 years, and one of the things I always knew was coming was people that returned to Maui that came to see the, the maid, the pool attendant, the bartender, you know, they didn't like seeing security, they didn't like seeing me, but they liked everybody else. And really what it was, it was the relationships we formed and the system that we had in place of hospitality. The moment you got on the property, we welcome you. The moment you get off the plane, they welcome you. And this is what hospitality should be about. But giving back is important. We now have to learn that the hospitality industry has to work in tandem when it comes to housing, when it comes to keeping the people. You know, I visited places like the Kits, Grand Caymans, Turks, Mexico. And let me tell you, the first thing when you go to those resorts and you meet the people that are working there, you find most of them are not native. They come from somewhere else. So they have no connection to the Aina. They have no perspective on what the history of the place is. They come from Yugoslavia, they come from Ethiopia, they come from the United Kingdom, they come from Philippines, they come from all over the world, work two years and go home. So your experience in the area, your resort experience is different. You may have nice beaches, they have beautiful beaches, but it's not the same because you cannot connect with them. Because if you come back in a few years, they're not there anymore. 
Here, I know there are many workers that have worked 30, 40 years in the hospitality industry. And they passed on aloha, whatever and whoever came to their property or even on the street. How many of us, raise your hand, would stop and help some tourist that had a flat tire? Raise your hand. Now that's sad, I don't see any hands. <laughs> well, you know, the reason for that question was, we did that and we continue to do that. And you know, if you saw, how many of you, if you saw a local with a flat tire would stop and help them? Raise your hand. Okay. So I'm gonna close with this. Now, now I got everybody thinking, right? The bottom line in all of this, hospitality and respect is given and earned. We earn it by giving it, and we hope we, they learn to give it back to us. It's an educational process, and I agree. We need to look at what kind of visitors come and how we treat them and how we want to be treated because this is our home. This is not Disneyland or, Walt, uh, or Disney World. This is Hawaii, and we need to make sure Hawaii stays Hawaii. Mayor Roth? You know, I was just, uh, driving in. I didn't, wasn't able to come yesterday. I, I uh, was picked up by Cyrus Jonathan, uh, fine executive assistant, the brains of Hawaii County, young Hawaiian man. I said, uh, Cyrus, what was your number one takeaway uh, from yesterday? And he talked about Auntie Twinkle's statement about how Kuleana unlocks mana. I thought, wow, what a powerful, you know, statement. He, he asked this question about what, how we have, you know, this Hawaiian uh, DNA. Well, we all have to realize this is all of our kuleana to make sure that, you know, we're doing the right thing. We already have the tourists or people in the hospital. No, I think they're visitors. We have our visitors. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. <laughs> they, they're already coming for our aina. Now we have to connect them to our culture. That's how we tr transform things. Um, and I'll, while I'm, you know, blowing Cyrus's head up, <laughs> just be careful with those of you sitting around him, it, it may get a little bit bigger. Um, Cyrus, brilliant guy, he came up with this uh, app for a phone called Kahea. And one of the things that they're working on on this app is a, a little thing that when you go to a location and you're in that area, you'll get like a notification. That notification, you'll push on the app, you'll, you'll hear maybe an alelo for, you know, uh, some, some kind of chant for the area. You'll hear uh, an auntie or uncle maybe telling a story about that area, giving a cultural, you know, um, you know some education there, and then talking about ways to behave maybe in that area. I think that's what, what you're looking at, yeah, Cyrus? <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's those kinds of things. You know, if we can get them to understand our visitors, to, to really embrace our culture, they're gonna give back, they're gonna take care of the Aina. You know, that's, as we think about regenerative tourism as well, how do we, get people thinking a little bit different. So I think the culture um, has a lot of opportunities there that we can do, and we just have to remember that it's not just people in the hospitality industry's kuleana, it's not government's kuleana, it's everybody. And how do we get our keiki involved in that? How do we get our businesses involved in that? How do we get our surfers and everybody else to, to embrace that? Um, and I think by doing that, we, we have some real transformation. Thank you, Mayor Rod. Mayor Kawakami, Derek? I do believe so. I do believe that our people have regenerative, we have a regenerative nature in our DNA and not just a believer, but I was fortunate enough to be able to see it and witness. You know, they say when people are 
pushed up against the wall and they're faced with tough times, that it brings out the best. And I can tell you in 2018, when our community was hit with historic flooding, we got to see people put their differences aside and come together with one common goal, and that was to dig themselves out of a deep mess. They didn't rely on government. They took it upon themselves to regenerate, to rebuild, to make the place better. And it was um, the most heartwarming thing to see. And as mayor, I've got to witness it time and time again. During the pandemic, we had another flooding event in Hanalei, the hill came down on, on its side again. We had a rock slide in Waimea. We had historic flooding in Wailua. Koloa got flooded twice. And um, I have my chief of staff, Sarah Blaine from Maui. And she was there during the 2018 flood when Mayor Carvalho was at the helm. And she's been there for every disaster that I've had to go through. And the one thing we learned is we as government representatives should step out of the way and support our people because it's in their DNA to rebuild. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mayor Blanjadi. That was great, Derek. That was, I'm so glad I didn't have to follow Victorino. Uh, <laughs> You know, um, kind of to, to the question on John's comment, uh, in, in trying to understand this concept, place is central, and its sacredness is what's celebrated. And I can tell you that in 1965, when I first arrived in Hawaii, you know, I think the first bit of Hawaiian I learned was ua mau ke'ea, ika pono. And the life of the land is perpetuated in right, righteousness. And everything I've ever learned from all of my mentors since that time has been about that. And so I, I really do believe that it's symbiotic in our Hawaiian culture as a people, as diverse as we are, to love our land, to celebrate that, to respect it. So in that regard, I have great hopes for the future in this transformative period now into where we're stepping and where we're going. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. <clears throat> That's so inspiring to hear all your responses. It really is. But I'd like to shift the discussion now to the visitors themselves. We can't have regenerative tourism unless we can manage how many, what they do, their behavior, their values. What do you all think about that? Do you have ways that you think we can make sure that the visitors that come embrace Malama and the values that we have? Because if we continue to have visitors that don't, regenerative tourism, I think, is far off into the future. Anybody like to take a stab at that? Well, I think everybody up here on this stage and everybody that wants to get into public service just wants to help. You know, we just, we want to fix things, but I think in our sense of urgency to fix things that we come up with solutions before we really identify what the problem is. And I think you touched upon it. And I say this because in order to start formulating programs to get our visitors to Malama, we have to understand that the problem that we have is an inventory problem and a lack of the control of our carrying capacity. In my humble opinion, I think at the county level, and it's gonna require the county councils as well, that the thing that Kauai did and was able to identify first is that we need to have a grasp on our inventory. And we do a good job with timeshare units and with hotel rooms and with vacation rentals and bed and breakfast as long as they're within the visitor destination area. We have a good 
inventory of how many units we have. But the proliferation of what we would call vacation rentals that are operating outside of the VDA is where the struggle is. And I didn't say illegal, because what our planning department realized is that it's technically not illegal unless the county has it defined in their zoning that it's not a residential use. So first and foremost, we have to get a good grasp as to how many people we can accommodate. We do have a carrying capacity. The first thing that we did is our planning director, who's now my managing director, went to Puno. I have to disclose that. <laughs> he created a vacation rental bill that basically took a look at some metrics. Were they paying their general excise tax? Were they paying their TAT? They've been paying their taxes. We're not going to engage in a lawsuit. They're grandfathered in. But every year, they have to come and get a use certificate. So we grasp that market and we shut the spigot off. But then we had third-party platforms, the double-edged sort of technology, Airbnb, VRBO, and we were pulling our hair out because we just got a grasp on the illegal vacation rental market. And then technology took us to another challenge. But I'm glad to say that under our administration, we, we are the first county in the nation to be able to enter into a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with both Airbnb and VRBO, <laughs> that they will only advertise those vacation rentals that have a legitimate use certificate, and it's been working out fantastic. <laughs> so I think that's the first step. Thank you. Mayor Blanchetti, do you want to? Well, I agree very much with what Derek said, in fact, um, our ordinance is different on Oahu, and it is illegal, you know, and we have the mapping software, and to give a perspective, there's probably between 10 and 14,000 homes that have been used for short-term vacation rentals on this island. More than 50% of those are owned from people, or owned by people who don't even live here. And so we've got to get out of the business to Derek's point about managing tourism and not wholesaling this place. This is a retail product. You know, we gotta, we gotta love it, you gotta care, care for it. And I think that, as I brought up earlier about Bill 41, it's a big step forward. You know, now it's gonna be up to us to enforce it. But we think, it, we think that this helps create the future we all, we all hope to see. We kind of know what our capacity is. If you talk to the hotel operators, they'll tell you that on any given year, at a really high level of occupancy, it better be maybe 90% over 12 months, which would be atypical. But even at that level, our carrying capacity is about 7.5 million visitors a year, somewhere between 7.5 and, and 8. We had 10.6 in 19. If COVID did not happen, all the models indicated we would have exceeded 11 million in 2020. And by 2021, it was at 11.5. They were not going into hotel rooms. They were going beyond the hotel rooms. And so that's what we're stepping in to mitigate, and I'm very confident that it's gonna make a huge difference on a going forward basis. So it is about carrying capacities, understanding our limits, and then, and then doing something about it. So thank you, you're welcome. Yeah, you know, I, I really agree with uh, what Mayor Kawakami and, and, and Mayor Blangiardi are saying. You know, as I look at this though, every island is a little bit different, and we have to think about every island differently. And, um, you know, for example, I, I think Kauai Island, we're in a much better position than all the other islands. We have, uh, if you look at our, our visitors, we have a pretty high level of, of visitor that pretty much stays in resorts and may go off to, to see some other sites versus, you know, a, a visitor may be coming to Waikiki and there's, not their, their vacation is not in their hotel. Um, right now on our island, every hotel on West Hawaii side could take about 50 to 150 employees. Um, so so there's, a, there's a, a real issue with them being able to carry any more than they are. Part of that goes back to this, this situation. It really comes down to government to make sure that we have good uh, laws when it comes to short-term vacation rentals. You know, Kauai 
started off with some good ones. Um, Honolulu has some really good ones. We're in the process of changing our short-term vacation rentals. So we're making sure that housing really goes to our local families. As we're developing, thank you, as we're developing our housing, we have to be developing housing so that it's not the high-end people that are moving in, but it's our local families so our kids don't have to keep on moving off island, moving out of state to, to find a place to live. And so it, it really takes intentional thinking. And you know, I think as a group of mayors, we have these conversations and we are all thinking, I think, in that same manner about being intentional to make sure that our kids have a place to be. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Roth. Mayor Victorini, how's visitor behavior on Maui? Thank you. Uh, ditto again, because they've all said what I would have said if I was first. <laughs> I went intentionally last because I wanted my mayors to have an opportunity, and I agree with them wholeheartedly. But there's another segment of all this that makes Maui unique. I have three islands, three different islands. I have the island of Lanai, which 97% of that island is owned by one man called Larry Ellison. It is really difficult because he has brought in a lot of what I call regenerative change, but is it ex being accepted by the residents? In some cases, no. And that's where we've had our challenges, is that they mean well, but they're not listening to the community, and that's important. On Molokai, it's a different situation. Molokai, some people don't want any change, others need some change, and so I have to work very diligently with all of these communities to make sure they understand that we're there to help them. We're not there to tell them what to do. And government should never be telling people what to do, except when there's a pandemic, sorry. <laughs> but beyond that, we should not tell people what to do. We should be listening to them and working to make sure what they are asking for, what they need, within reason, is taken care of. And then you got Maui Island, which is totally different because there's Hana, Kipuhulu, Kanayo, there are remote areas, even more remote than some of yours, um, Mayor Roth. Not as far, but remote. And they want a different type of life. These are fishing villages that, like Middle we need to protect, and we are working on that, because they deserve that. That's the communities want, and we're there for them. <laughs> South Maui, West Maui, was designed for the hospitality industry. We put Kapalua, Kanapali, and, and those resorts in West Maui, in South Maui, Makena, Wailea, and Kihe. That was what the plan was. Our, our forefathers saw that we wanted high-end, good quality tourists that stayed on the resort, like Mitch mentioned, and enjoyed the ambience of the area and not be traversing in areas that they shouldn't be going to. <laughs> However, like Kauai, we did enter an agreement with Airbnb and Expedia, and they took off almost 1,400 uh, illegal vacation, and they were illegal vacation rentals right off the books in a one swell swoop. <laughs> However, there's more that needs to be done. And this regenerative idea is really a journey, and you mentioned that early, earlier, I should say. It is a journey. We're not gonna solve everything today, tomorrow, next week, unless we all start walking in that direction. We need to take the first steps, and that's why what's happening in Maui now is we're now putting our, our, our visitor attractions, we're putting uh, GPS, and we're trying to now monitor who's going there and what's happening. We're changing Park, Park Maui now will be where visitors will pay for parking and our residents will be free. They'll have special parking for them because that's their, their place. But more importantly, is working together with the hospitality industry to make sure these changes are fair to everyone. But the priority must be our residents, our residents must be the benefactors, and they must receive more than they have to give. And that's my take on all of this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, we're moving to our last question, and this focuses on the future. Uh, regenerative tourism requires that we vision, that we look to the long term. So I've asked each of our mayors to imagine they're in 2030. 
how would they like tourism in 2030 to demonstrate regenerative principles? What would it look like on your island if you have impl implemented your policies and you've got a regenerative tourism or moving towards it in 2030? Would you allow Rick to be first? <laughs> Rick? Yeah, as a big first. Please go first. You want me to go first? <laughs> You know me, I like to be fair to all of you, right? Yeah. You've been sacrificed, Rick. No, Mayor Victorino, I could listen to you all day. <laughs> um, you know, it's hard to predict the future. We're trying to create it with each and everything that we're doing right now. So headed in this direction and taking it most literally is the people who come here with a respect for this place, who have been educated in advance, who come here with that sense of purpose that they want to come and experience something very special in the world that Hawaii has to offer. You know, long ago, I always remembered a great tagline by the Hawaii Visitors Bureau. This was back in the 60s. It simply used to say, and they don't use it anymore, it simply used to say, come for the beauty, but stay for the people. And you know, I would like to think the people who come here as tourism come with that expectation as well, that they come here to experience what and how we live here. It's sort of like, in some ways, like when I think about when I go visit Italy, I have an entirely different feeling about going into that country, and not just because of my Italian heritage, it's the essence of that. And we have so much essence here that is so unique to the world, and so special, and so coveted, if you will, from people who really long for that. It's, we are so rich in that regard. And so I would hope that people would come here with that sense of feeling, and that sense of anticipation, and has been said throughout today, a sense of coming here and trying to do something to help make it a better place and have that island experience and share with us in our own efforts and our own struggles to constantly improve our land and our people. So that's what I'm hoping for. It's going to take some real education. We are at a pivotal moment in time. We've said that. Kuwait, I'm very proud of you and everything that you're leading. And I'm, I'm really excited about the road ahead and the future we're trying to create. Thank you. Mayor Roth? So, you know, I, I, I think there's a couple of things, and, you know, completely agree with what Mayor Belangiardi is saying, um, that people come for the beauty, but you stay for the place. And, you know, part of that is that we are doing things like this Kahea app and, you know, teaching our community, our visitors about our culture, making sure that in 2030 that we have a lot of uh, people in the hospitality industry that are doing the right thing. And I, I'm going to just give you a couple of examples, and I'll go into my last one. Um, we have a group that has adopted a beach park, and so people that are going into the water, um, they're educating the visitors about, you know, the coral to make sure that they're, they're being respectful for the land. They're making sure that they're wearing the right um, sunscreen so they're not impacting. Um, and they're, they're, they're talking about the area. Um, businesses like Iron Man, uh, a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about Iron Man, but the Iron Man organization, um, during the pandemic, they gave over a million dollars to make sure that the people in the community were fed, so we're taking care of the people. With the people that come in, they have a, the theory of live aloha, and they talk to them about the importance of preserving the land and, and making sure that you have a good thing. I'd like to see all businesses really making sure that people are doing the right things for the right reasons. And then finally, in 2030, we're really protecting our Vaipana, our, our areas of, of importance. Um, but there's a tale to be tell, told. In our DMAP plan, we looked at you know, giving certain areas a time to cool off and you know, let them regenerate as we talk about regenerative tourism. Um, one of those places that we talked about was YPO Valley. Um, and it just so happened, it wasn't because we were going to give it a cooling off period, but we had a, a um, study that came back that said the road going down into the valley was dangerous. And so for a safety reason, we made a very difficult decision to give that area cooling off as they fix the road. And I was sitting down for breakfast with Auntie Ku, who lives at Kua Haile, and she says that, you know, this is the first time since she was a child that she's been able to see 
the valley come back to that, air, to that life that it had when she was a kid. Um, she, and so, you know, it's great that they're able to show that. And so as we think about our areas of importance, we need to make sure that we're taking care of those areas. But there's a cautionary tale. Whenever you do something like that, you're going to have, as a leader, people who are going to come back and be very upset. So right now, as we're doing this, and we didn't do it just to give the area cooling off, we did it for a safety reason. But I have a lot of people who are very thankful, mostly people who you know, come from that Ahupua'a, that area from the valley. But I also have a lot of other people who are very angry that they can't get to this area. But it's, it's something that, it, it's gonna take big decisions and hopefully we'll have leaders from the community, from government, from all other places that are willing to make the right decisions for the right reasons. And you know, that's, that's what I see we're gonna have to do in 2030, by 2030. Thank you. Mayor Derek, Mayor Kawakami, how do you see Kauai's tourism in 2030? You know, the first time I brought my wife, Monica, to meet my mom, we were 19 years old, and my mom, who grew up in Hule'ia Valley, was a country girl, and they were dirt poor, but they were rich in a way, and she told Monica, who was just my girlfriend at the time, be careful, because he's a free spirit, and he's a dreamer, and his head is always in the clouds. In 2030, if I could make these dreams come true, I'll be about 53 years old. I hope Haley will have graduated from college. I guess technically she would be old enough to give me and my wife some grandkids, and so it would be a Saturday. <laughs> and I would be bringing my grandson or my granddaughter to my favorite place to surf, and I would be teaching my grandchild how to do what I love to do, and hopefully they would fall in love with that. But there would be a noticeable difference because we found a parking stall. <laughs> and, and there were visitors arriving via shuttle and being greeted by a Kuleana crew member, a member of our community that's there to welcome our guests. And kids from near and far are playing in the little pond at Poipu Beach. And our ocean safety officers are also out there greeting people, saying, hey, aloha, welcome to Poipu Beach. It's a great day to swim, have fun, stay on this side. <laughs> and, and we would have a thriving community. And the sentiment towards visitors would have done a 180. And instead of looking at visitors as takers, we would have a different mindset. Government would have come in to really provide more housing for our people that have to work in the industry and so that almost polarizing feeling that our people have about this industry would be switched over in a way that we get to see the benefits because it just seems like it's a lot better deal for all of us, that we're not getting shortchanged. than I think Kauai, in my dreams, would be a place where visitors have the ability to see places on the island that not even local people are able to see if they're not willing to come in and malama. And it's happening today. If you want to go and see Ale Coco and work alongside the Hulia River, the only way to do it is to go down there and work with the organization Malama Hulia. And when you talk about regenerative tourism, 
I think that's what it means. We'll have visitors that come back every year, generations upon generations, and instead of wanting to go where I want to go, which is just to the beach, they're going to go out there and leave their mark by leaving Kauai a better place than what they found it in. Fascinating. Thank you, Thank you Mike Awakami. And you have the last word, Mervitrini. First of all, thank you, my son. <laughs> because a lot of what I would have said, he said. So at least I know that's one of my sons that listens to me. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Kawakami. And first of all, again, let's thank the three mayors for all their great work. Come on, let's give them a big hand. She just said, you too, but you know what? I've always been a person who believes in aloha is doing. Our kuleana is to make sure all of what has been said in Maui County is being done. We are looking to a great future. First of all, renewable energy. By the year 2030, Maui should be at 85 or 90 percent of renewable energy. That's not a goal, that's a fact. Water, because it's a big issue all around, but more so on Maui, we are now looking at forming authorities to help regulate and work with water issues for their community, each individual community. However, I warn them, and I ask them, the communities, to understand that what happens in Hana affects a country. What happens in South Maui affects Kahului. We are not one in our own. The only two islands that really don't have to worry about sharing much of what they have is Molokai and Lanai because they're small populations and their systems are interconnectable. But even there, we need to continue to work with those communities to better that area. Because farming, my biggest dream is to have ecotourism, volunteerism, sports tourism coming to Maui. Because when Derek's teams came from Kauai, they told me, Mayor, can you call our mayor and tell him we like one facility like this? You got that message, right, Derek? <laughs> my son will take care of that. So I'm not worried about that. But no, I'm proud of what we have on Maui, but most importantly, I'm proud of our people. Yes, we have our differences. Yes, we, we don't always agree on everything, but we've learned to agree to disagree. And yes, I understand that it's not about government. It's not about business. It's not about the hospitality. It's about our community. And that's our most important commodity is our community. You make us great. So I'll close with this. Because she's got her mic up, that means the signal, time running out. <laughs> and nobody took two minutes, by the way, today. Well, we, that's what we're told. But I'll close with this. Each and everyone out there in this room today, I'll give you your kuleana from my perspective. It's to make your family, your community, the best it can be and work together to make sure the rest joins in and we have one community called Hawaii. That's, I think, what Kamehameha has wanted. He brought the islands together. He wanted one community. So let's work as a community and make Hawaii no kawaii, just like Maui is no kawaii. Mahalo and aloha. Mahalo. I think we're so lucky to have these four inspiring leaders to lead us along to regenerative tourism. Let's give them all a big mahalo. Thank you so much.